My name is Dino Christensen. I am the faculty in residence at Killeshawn Hall down the way. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the faculty in residence program, we are a diverse group of BU faculty charged with adding an intellectual dimension uh, to your residential experience, and we do so by living in the same uh, BU buildings as you do. So if you see old people like me walking around your, your hall, it's probably faculty and residents. You should uh, introduce yourself and uh, take advantage of a number of events that we host throughout the year, including test kitchens, watch parties of various uh, political and sporting events, uh, field trips, exercise classes, and a lot more. Um, Again, we hope that uh, we get to know each and every one of you, and uh, please, please don't be shy. Introduce yourselves to your faculty and residents and take advantage of the, the free and fun events that we host throughout the year similar to this. Okay, we have, I think we have two more exciting speakers for you, uh, but uh, one is currently missing, and so I will skip to our, our, our third speaker of the evening, and uh, it is with, it is with truly great pleasure that I introduce him. He has been a, uh, a mentor, a co-author, and a dear friend of mine since my arrival here at BU six years ago. Uh, his name is Douglas Kreiner. He's an associate professor and the director of graduate studies in political science. He's also a faculty in residence. He's the one who convinced me to uh, join on to the faculty in residence program. He previously lived, he and his wife, uh, Jillian, who's also uh, a faculty in residence and faculty member in engineering, uh, lived for several years in Miles Standish and now currently reside at Stu V, Stu V1. Stu V1. Uh, Doug's an expert in American political institutions, separation of power dynamics, American policy making. Uh, a little known fact of that is that he is also very passionate and remarkably knowledgeable about ancient Roman history and a little bit less so about uh, current Italian pop culture. <laughs> he graduated from MIT in 2001, received his PhD in government from Harvard University in 2006. I don't know where those places are. He's the author of four books, all at top academic pr uh, presses, 20 peer-reviewed articles and umpteen law reviews and book chapters. It is a remarkable accomplishment for any political scientist, especially one only 10 years out. He most recently published two books on interbranch politics, one of which just won the Richard Neustadt Award for the best book in the field of American presidency. He's also well known on campus as a terrific teacher. Perhaps several of you already know him. He's already won the Gitner Award for Excellence in Teaching. And for those of you who enjoy his talk today, you'll be happy to know that he teaches a number of very popular courses on campus, including ones on the presidency, Congress, domestic politics, and the use of force, as well as separation of powers. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kreiner. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I was thinking about uh, this talk uh, throughout the day and thinking about how often we're formed by that first formative political experience, you know, the first big presidential election that we get to, to experience and live through. Uh, and for me, one was sort of interesting growing up in South Carolina uh, during the, the Clinton re-election campaign, uh, having dogs literally sicked on me, you know, for going uh, knocking door to door. And then of course the 2000 election where we had the winner of the popular vote not win the presidency. I didn't think anything could top that. Uh, but for all of you, I think we actually have ordered up uh, something to top that. So the title for my talk is American Politics in the Age of Trump. And what I'd like to do is two things. First, I'd like us to look back uh, and think back to how things played out over the course of the primaries. Uh, and to really understand that, we've got to go back even further. Then I want to sort of get us up to speed, uh, sort of try and figure out where we are, uh, and make a couple of uh, prognostications maybe about what we're gonna see in the next uh, few weeks leading up to November 8th. <clears throat> All right, so the first question, right? How did Donald Trump conquer the GOP? Uh, <clears throat> it's really interesting. The Constitution is a funny document in many ways. On certain things, it is incredibly precise. 
including telling you exactly how old you have to be to run for president, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What day the president is going to be inaugurated, which we even bothered to change with the constitutional amendment. But on other critical questions, such as how do you pick who's going to run for president, the Constitution says nothing. Uh, so as a result, the way in which we pick the nominees for our major parties has evolved significantly over time. Uh, and if you want to understand Trump and where Trump comes from, we really have to go back to a previous election. We have to go back to the race in 1968. So you've all seen maps, sorry, you've all seen maps that look like this before, right? Different shadings, different colors for different candidates. Who's the big winner here, obviously? Yellow. Right? So all we got to do is figure out what the key is, and yellow is clearly going to have been the Democratic nominee in 1968. The only problem is that 1968, yellow is these states didn't hold a primary. So primaries and caucuses, they've been around since the progressive era in the turn of the 20th century, but there was no legal requirement that anyone held a primary or a caucus. Uh, if you won a state's primary or caucus, there was no guarantee that the people who went from that state that were delegates to the National Convention would actually vote for you. Uh, so primaries were largely derided as beauty contests uh, and not much more. Trump would have loved those. He's very good at beauty contests, right? <laughs> um, except for the candidates he doesn't care for. So in any event, what happens here in 1968? You've got uh, we have one little, I don't think I have a thing out there, but you can see New Hampshire. Uh, it's a different color. Uh, that was President Johnson. President Johnson was running for re-election. He narrowly won in New Hampshire, and then he dropped out uh, because the Vietnam War saw that there were a good chance that he would not uh, emerge victorious. His vice president, Hubert Humphrey, throws his hat into the ring and chooses uh, a somewhat maybe risky strategy, or one that we wouldn't recognize today. He chose not to enter a single primary or caucus. And instead, he went around barnstorming across the country, not talking to us, average voters. He talked to party insiders. And he started locking them down to support his nomination. So you have uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, Senator Smathers, just a, a home son state from, uh, from the state of Florida, uh, and Bobby Kennedy. Uh, going across the country, they're battling it out. Uh, Bobby Kennedy wins the last primary in California, and he's assassinated that night. Uh, so what happens is a fiasco uh, in Chicago. It was kind of ironic 40 years later to see Barack Obama uh, accept the presidency, you know, declare victory in basically the exact same place where his party had almost disintegrated uh, four decades earlier. So because of this violence, Democrats look at this. They only lose to Richard Nixon by less than half a point. They said, wow, if we hadn't blown it so badly in Chicago, maybe we could have beaten Nixon. They said, so what are we going to do? They get together, God forbid, political scientists, actually, uh, and they helped advise the McGovern-Fraser Commission, uh, and they decided that what they really need is to make all of us be more participative in picking who our presidential candidates are going to be. The state and local parties basically said, eh, Forget this, we don't want people messing in our affairs, so instead we're just gonna totally turn it over to you, the voters. And overnight, almost, we see pretty close to universal adoption of primaries or caucuses. Uh, <clears throat> this has some intended consequences and some unintended consequences. One of the biggest consequences that you see is something that looks like this. My goodness, we have a lot of candidates uh, that throw their hats into the ring. Everyone drinks the Kool-Aid and somehow thinks that he or she has an outside chance at least of being president. More important though than just the raw number of people that seek the presidency is the type of people that seek the presidency. So everyone in a circle here, these are people who never ever would have been major party nominees under the old system in which party insiders uh, picked who that candidate was going to be. No Ben Carson, no Ted Cruz. I mean, his own party can't stand him. Carly Fiorina, uh, you know, I guess Mike Huckabee was a governor, but he's pretty much a weight loss advisor and Fox News commentator, right? Uh, and of course, Donald Trump down at the bottom right. These folks never would have had a chance. In the same way that I think a lot of people would admit that Barack Obama maybe someday would have been uh, a presidential candidate, but never as a four-year senator, uh, you know, he never would have been able to do that under the old system. <clears throat> so one of the questions that political scientists have asked uh, is who holds the most influence then and who gets to win these things? Uh, 
Not often do our books actually pick up much in terms of circulation outside of when we make you buy them to read them in class. Uh, but this is one that's gotten some play. It's been on 538, it's been on a lot, of, a lot of other blogs called The Party Decides and it says, you know what? The smoke-filled room is still very much uh, alive and party insiders still indirectly sort of winnow down our choices and we don't have as much influence as we want to think over who the nominees are going to be. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen a number of developments, and there have been scholars, Professor Christensen, uh, one of the most important, I think, who has pointed out that there have been changes uh, that have weakened the grip of the parties on the nominations. Things like new media and social media, uh, things like Citizen United, uh, and the rise of mega donors, super PACs, all of these other ways to sort of break the stranglehold that the parties have had even since 1968 in terms of limiting our choices. <clears throat> So one way we might look at it as far as does the party decide is who does the party rally around? Who do the party elites rally around? And what you can see here, which no one can because it's too small, I'm really sorry, uh, is that very, very few people rallied around Donald Trump. Uh, Trump had 46 uh, endorsement points, according to Nate Silver. Marco Rubio had 136. Ted Cruz had 114. And basically, Trump's piddling total was mainly a result of people piling onto the bandwagon when it looked pretty much uh, certain that Trump was going to get it. In fact, right, we have the hashtag, never Trump. Uh, that's not started by Democrats. That's started by Republicans. You know, Trump was able uh, to really skillfully adapt new media and social media, tw Twitter and the rest, right, to rally people. Um, he used uh, the media in a provocative way to really dominate coverage. Uh, and he tapped into a much broader phenomenon that I really think we see evidence of worldwide. Uh, so, as Trump likes to tweet, he called it, right? Trump called Brexit, uh, and he went to Scotland, a place that voted to remain in the UK to congratulate Britons on taking their country back. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily show a great awareness of what's going on in the world, but it does show that Trump is really good about keeping his thumb uh, or finger on the pulse of the American people. He's tapping into something broader uh, about nationalism, populism, uh, with a little bit of a, of a, t of a uh, twinge of authoritarianism uh, within there as well. <clears throat> so what about 2016 and thinking about the general election? Uh, on the one hand, right, it seems clearly to be exceptional, but I want to ask, is it almost, strangely, surprisingly normal? I think that's a little paradoxical from all the stuff that we've seen. In some ways, of course, this is an election unlike any other. Right, we have, the, for the first time, a reality television show uh, host who has become the nominee of a major party. On the other side, right, we have uh, the first female presidential candidate in American history. Uh, something else that makes this unusual is that these are, uh, by every metric, the two most unliked nominees that we've ever had uh, since the advent of modern polling. Uh, so you can sort of see where they rank. Uh, the only thing, the only saving grace for Hillary uh, is that people seem to dislike Donald Trump significantly more even than they do her. But they're both sort of underwater. Uh, more people dislike them or say they dislike them than actually like them. Uh, so what do we make of this? Well, there's a couple of tools that I think we might uh, be able to look at that suggest that maybe, in a way, this election is actually not so exceptional or atypical after all. So to do that, I'd just like to talk for a couple minutes about forecast models. Uh, the type that you normally see if you've come across it uh, in the media is something like this one, uh, taken several hours ago from Nate Silver's 538, right? So this is a forecast model that uses information from polls. Uh, it aggregates them, it weights them, it compares them to trends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's constantly cranking, which is why you can see updated one hour ago. You can even get a thing, I think, to, to uh, text you uh, when there's a new 538 update out there available, right? This is a dynamic forecast model. It's always changing, which is why we've had everything from a certain Clinton win a couple weeks ago to Trump pulling ahead to Hillary up with a 78% chance of winning. Political scientists believe these models and find a lot of utility in them, but they've also endeavored to do something else. Uh, this is a different type of forecast model that says, what are the fundamentals of the race? Meaning, if we could sort of take out the campaigns, if we could take out the candidates and have John Q. Democrat and Susan Q. Republican running against each other in the current environment, what would we expect 
given how other elections have unfolded in similar environments. So we use a lot of data, uh, going back to the Truman administration, we crank it through a statistical model and we use that to output predictions. Just like polls, I don't know that you want to put too much uh, stock in any one forecast model, uh, but this is uh, the most updated uh, that I've had, you know, uh, been able to get at right before class to, or right before <laughs> the uh, talk today. And what you can see is that if you take the average of the forecast models, it predicts an incredibly tight race, uh, given the state of the economy, given the popularity of the incumbent president and given the fact that the Democrats have held the White House for two consecutive terms, it's very tough to win three consecutive elections for a single party, uh, and it predicts roughly a narrow one-point Clinton edge, all else being equal. So what do we see? There are a lot of different ways of aggregating polls. 538 has its way, pollster has its way, the real clear politics average has its way, and when we look at those, it seems to range right now to somewhere around a four to seven point lead for Secretary Clinton. Um, <clears throat> that suggests, right, when coupled with the forecast models, that Secretary Clinton might actually be overperforming what we would expect. She's asked before, why am I not at 50? Well, she's not at 50, but she's doing better than we might expect a Democrat to do in this uh, circumstances by about three to six points. Now, is that a testament to Hillary Clinton's strength as a candidate, or is it a, a testament to Donald Trump's weakness that's an open debate and remains to be seen. So, uh, for conclusion, unfortunately I don't have one. Uh, it's gonna be shaped by all of you. There's still time to register to vote. Uh, I encourage you to do it. Google it, it's easy to find. And if you are registered, get your absentee ballots or make sure you head to the polls here on campus. Thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Um, I forgot how to word this. I, my question's about third party candidates. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of talk among people who aren't really into either of the major party candidates and how they're thinking about, about voting for them, including my dad, and I want to talk him out of it. So, <laughs> kind of asking, like, what are the implications of people kind of using their vote to not pick one of the major party candidates and instead vote for a third party candidate? And, like, what are the implications of that? Yeah. Sure, thank you very much. So, you know, it depends, obviously, right? Uh, is the third party candidate taking votes almost exclusively from one candidate? Are they taking roughly equally? Uh, are there ways of getting at that? Well, there are a couple, right? We can find out, we can simply come out and ask people. We say, you know, like, uh, who would you vote for if you had to pick between the other two? If we forced your choice, uh, we can look at that. Jill Stein, it's really hard to understand what Trump voter out there is being like, oh, I don't like Donald Trump or what Republican, so I'm gonna vote for Jill Stein. That's pretty clearly, those are votes that are coming out of Hillary Clinton's pocket. Gary Johnson uh, seems to be a little bit uh, different story. You can ask people who they'd vote for. The other thing you can do is you can construct a model and you can try and understand, given someone's age, gender, race, uh, educational attainment, all of these things, income, uh, we can say, what makes you more likely to be a Clinton voter versus a Trump voter, and then what's the profile of the Johnson voter? I think from every, the best information we have right now, uh, Johnson seems to be taking a little more away from Secretary Clinton than, she is from, than he is from Donald Trump. Um, so there is that. The other thing is that third party candidates tend at the polls, or at the ballot box, to underperform their polls. Uh, so I don't believe that Gary Johnson is gonna get eight, 10% of the vote. The other thing that we do see is that um, uh, when you ask people how you feel about the candidates, uh, if you like Trump, you're very likely to vote for Trump. If you like Clinton, you're very likely to vote for Clinton. If you like Gary Johnson, at the end of the day, the correlation between how much you like Gary Johnson and whether or not you actually vote for Gary Johnson is a whole lot weaker. Uh, because there are a lot of people that say they're gonna do it, right? But at the end of the day, they vote strategically. They hold their nose and they vote for one of the two candidates that actually has a viable path that's closer to his or her preferences. So, you know, we'll see what the ultimate effect is. Uh, if it's really close, like in 2000, my formative election, sure, you know, uh, Nader cost score the election. There's, there's no way around that. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, I'm not sure that it's gonna make too much of a difference. Um, 
Well, thank you for your talk, first of all. It was very informative. Thank you. Um, in an age where people tend not to trust politicians, what do you? What is your take on the rise of candidates like Ben Carson, like Donald Trump, and do you think that that's helping or hurting our political system as a whole? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You're exactly right. By any metric, uh, trust in political institutions has gone way down. Uh, that said, I think it's long been really popular to run for Washington by running against it. You know, members of Congress, the same people that have been there for 30, 40 years, this is Donald Trump's critique, right? His most effective moment uh, at the first debate is to say, why haven't you fixed it? Well, everyone who's been in Washington all this time, they always paint this mythical narrative of I'm, I'm swimming against the stream, right? I'm the lone champion for you out there fighting against the system. Uh, people from Jimmy Carter through Ronald Reagan have all come at this and said, we don't need another Beltway insider. Bill Clinton, too, right? We need someone who's governed, you know, who's been in the state, who knows how things work. Uh, so, you know, uh, clearly this is a new dynamic in that it threatens uh, turnout uh, and among disillusioned voters, maybe younger voters, where trust in governing institutions is even lower, that it's just hard. Uh, to sort of get up. Uh, you know, a lot of times we would say, you know, if you take an economic perspective, it's completely rational not to vote. You, know, you say, oh, my vote is unlikely to be the one that tilts the balance one way or the other, so why do I want to bother to go out to the polls, to become informed about the candidates? Maybe I'll just sit it out and I'll stay home. Uh, well, what makes you get over that is that you somehow feel that you're affirming your participation in democracy, your faith in your country, it's your patriotic duty. And when you don't have that, uh, it does tend to lead a lot of people to stay out. So I think the only thing that you really, um, you know, the only advice I would have is to really sit back and think. You know, I might not like either of these candidates, but I'm going to be stuck with one of them, right? And they both have dramatically different visions for the future of the country and dramatically different visions on a whole lot of policies. And so neither are going to map on to exactly what you would do if you've been elevated to that office. But you need to think about which one is going to best serve my interests, most overlap with it, uh, and I'd encourage you all to exercise your suffrage. I, um, so you talked a bit about predictive models in one of the slides, and a model that caught my eye on the Washington Post was this American University's professor, I think his name is Lichtenstein, Lichtman. on yeah. 13 Keys to the White House, and he predicted, I'm, I'm in the biology department, so I'm yeah, truly asking Lichtman. from like a lay reader's perspective, he predicted a Trump presidency, and I'm uh -huh. curious as to what your take is on his predictive model. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think he's got a pretty good track record, you know, going back, let me just add. You know, some of these models are, you know, over there as well. It, it depends on, on what you're doing. Like, uh, the very first uh, model on here looks at primary results. The crazy thing about this one is that it, you know, he calculated his prediction, whereas Nate Silver's changes every day, sometimes multiple times per day. He's like, you know, on March 7th, I made my call, right? Uh, let's see. Yeah, the one there is very, very close. The Abramowitz model uh, is, I think, usually a pretty good one, and that has a Trump presidency as well. To me, one of the biggest things comes down to how hard do you think it's going to be for a Democrat to hold on to the White House for three terms? Uh, it's just, it is really hard for the same party to win three consecutive elections. Uh, so one idea, though, is that it's become easier. Right, that the number of swing voters, the number of actual persuadables is a lot smaller than it used to be, uh, in large part because we're so polarized. So we might not be polarized in the sense that, you know, uh, on the issues, I'm either far left or far right, but we are intensely polarized on partisan lines. And that party heuristic is so strong today that if I'm a Democrat, it really doesn't matter how much I dislike my nominee, I'm going to vote for that person. And if I'm a Republican, the same thing. And so the middle, right, you know, the... Um, uh, the median voter that you might go out and battle over, uh, it, it, there's just a really small segment of the electorate. So, which is also why you hear people like uh, David Pluff was on the other day talking about the turnout machine, right? And they said, this was an advantage that Republicans had in 2004. Uh, this is an advantage that Barack Obama seems to have really built up and perfected in 2008 and 2012. And so, 
you know, what does it, it may not matter. What if this country truly is 50-50, right? What's going to tilt the balance is not Kevin Costner in some terrible movie who's like, you know, the, the one swing voter that everyone gets to try and uh, battle over one way or the other. It's going to be who can turn out more Democrats or who can turn out more Republicans. Uh, so I think that's the other wild card in there uh, that, you know, the forecast models like this or like Lickman's um, really can't take into account. Normally, in most elections, uh, I'd like to think the campaigns don't matter very much. You know, Romney runs a good campaign, Obama runs a good campaign, and at the end of the day, they're, you know, there are two waves that are out of phase and they just cancel out and there's no real effect. But in this particular case, you know, what we saw in the Republican primaries is Ted Cruz was really, really good at getting his voters to the polls. Donald Trump was really good at sort of scattershot, right? I'll say, I'll throw a bomb and I'll rile up my base that way and I'm not gonna actually do the hard work about calling people, getting into the polls, running a major turnout operation. Uh, and so I think that in this particular race, you know, we might be set up for where one party does have a, a fairly significant advantage in some of the key battleground states. So I take, the, I take all of the, the forecast models maybe with a little bit more of a grain of salt than I would in the past. Thank all right, you thank much. you.